Our next speaker, our opening keynote, will be uh, Phil Karn, who should need no introduction. So uh, let's go ahead and welcome Phil. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, yeah, my topic is, I, I went around on this a number of times when I was asked to give a keynote here to come up with a title. So I came up with one that's kind of pseudoly vague on the program, but hopefully the subtitle explains what I'm really going to talk about. Um, basically, I want to make it possible for kids who are interested in electronics and communications, things like that, to learn all this stuff the way I did, which was a lot of fun. And I'll explain how. Okay, so first of all, about me, I, I had a career with Bell Labs, Bellcore, and Qualcomm uh, here in San Diego. I was here at Qualcomm for 20 years. I retired in, in 2011. Um, I've been a radio ham since my teen years when I was in high school. More about that later. Um, I like to say that I graduated high school the same year as Homer Simpson. Uh, so that, you know, kind of dates, dates me a little bit. Uh, Almost as long I've been involved in amateur satellites, uh, packet radio, I had a hand in the very early amateur uh, radio AX25 standard, my name's in there. Um, I've been a volunteer for AMSAT, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, since about 1980. Uh, it's been a long association. Uh, so there's been a, the theme here is that, you know, there's been a close, sometimes I can't even tell where my work, be, you know, play be, ends and my work begins, so, uh, but I enjoy it so much that I, you know, I, uh, I do it for fun as well as for, for my career. And I really do owe my career to ham radio. I mean, that's not, a, not an understatement. I really do. Well, first of all, how many of you are radio hams? Just out of curiosity. Okay, it's about right. All right. Uh, how many of you um, would say that ham radio brought you into your career, was a major influence in your career of those hams? Only a small number. Wow. Okay. Well, Bob, I expect Bob, of course. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, it really is true for me, and I want to make it, make it possible that that can still be true for anybody today you know, who's interested in these, in these same things. Uh, so I've been long involved in uh, protocols. Uh, I did a TCP IP package in the mid-1980s that became very popular. Um, and one thing, interesting thing about that uh, software is that I still get email 30 years later from people that thank me for writing that software I got them on the internet for the first time in their dial-up connections at 9600 baud or whatever. And not only that, they read the code and they said, well, you know, I can understand the code. I understand the protocols for the first time from reading your code and all the comments. And I got enough of those that I said, that's, that's really interesting. You know, maybe you can write software not just to be compiled and executed, but software also to be read and understood and learned from. And that got me thinking, well, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm good at that. Maybe I should keep doing that. Uh, so that's something I'm actually continuing to do in, in my retirement. Um, this is a picture that I think Bob will probably laugh at. This, this is 44 years ago. This is my ham radio club in, in high school. Uh, it's about the only picture of me from this era because I, I think I'd probably go destroy all the other ones that I can find, but I couldn't destroy this one. But this is where I got my start. I mean, I, it's no exaggeration to say that the, the two guys, the, the two adults in this picture on the ends were probably did more for my career than anybody else outside my own family. I mean, it's probably not an exaggeration. They really got me pointed in, in the right direction, and I really have ham radio to, to thank for that. Uh, so how did I learn during this time, even before I became a ham? I mean, I was a voracious reader. I asked questions of everybody. Uh, my father will tell you I never show up asking questions, and even today I don't. Um, I build kits when I could. Anybody remember Heathkit? You know, I were building those. Those were a lot of fun. Um, I never really liked just following the instructions, you know, one by one. You, you kind of want to, what, 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 what fun is there in following the instructions? And of course, I took a lot of stuff apart. You know, I, I took things apart. I learned from it. I uh, often broke it, but sometimes I could fix it. Sometimes I could even make it better. And so when this little, this little clip came along, uh, I found it very familiar. I'm worried about little Dilbert. How many people recognize themselves in this? Kids. What do you mean? Yesterday, I left him alone for a minute, and he disassembled the TV, our clock, and the stereo. That's perfectly normal. Kids take things apart. Oh! The part that worries me is he used the components to build a ham radio set. Oh, dear. <laughs> is that bad? Normally, I'd want to run an EEG on him, but the machine isn't working. 
it's worse than I feared. What is it? I'm afraid your son has the knack. The knack? The knack. It's a rare condition characterized by an extreme intuition about all things mechanical and electrical and utter social ineptitude. <laughs> Can he lead a normal life? No. He'll be an engineer. <laughs> Play there. Don't blame yourself. I love that clip. I mean, you know, I can laugh at myself, but it's, it's, it's me. It, it's, it's absolutely me. But, but also, it's also been a long time. I mean, that picture of me was taken 44 years ago. Times have changed, you know, and I can't expect today's kids to go back and, and disassemble 50-year-old TV sets uh, to learn how they worked. I mean, uh, it, the times have changed. You have to realize that, both for good and for bad. Um, and it means that you can't take a lot of stuff. I mean, for example, how many kids could take an iPhone apart and to understand how it works? I mean, the only thing you learn by taking an iPhone apart is how few components it takes to make a phone these days, right? You certainly wouldn't learn anything about modulation and coding and, and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, much, of the software, much of the functionality has moved to software, which is actually a good thing. I mean, it's why we're here. Um, and what's left, you know, the commercial hardware is often you know, really opaque. It's, it's almost unrepairable. Uh, you can't really modify or do anything with it other than what it was designed to do. It's just very much unlike uh, the stuff that I played with as a kid. Uh, but on the other hand, we also have other pieces of hardware that have become much more accessible and extremely powerful. I'm thinking, for example, the Raspberry Pi um, or just any of the, of the SDR kits that, that we work with. So, I mean, things are both good and bad. There's a lot of the commercial stuff has become almost um, you know, unusable as educational tools, while many other things have appeared that never would have been around before. So the question now is, okay, what about ham radio today? If you want to get kids into ham radio, what, how are you going to sell them on this? Tell them you can make phone calls from your car. Okay, that, that kind of used to be a neat thing. I mean, I walked around the Cornell campus with a two meter radio and you know, talk on an auto patch that, on a repeater that I built and my friends would just look at me like I was crazy. I mean, what's wrong with the phone in your room, right? Why do you have to make calls while you're walking around? Um, talk around the world for free, that used to be you know, a pretty unique thing we could do in ham radio. Uh, that's not exactly unique anymore. Oh, you can learn Morse code. Um, yeah, right. That's right, right. And of course, you take a look at a typical ham radio uh, meeting and what do you see are a bunch of aging white guys. That's a problem we're always very acutely aware of and are always trying to fix. Uh, we're not always sure how, but you know, we, we are trying. Uh, but I still think ham radio has a role to play, a very, very important one. And I, I've already really alluded to that, and it, it is education. I mean, that is one, if you look at the FCC rules for why the amateur service exists, um, Self-training and education is a very large part of it, and that's really the one thing that I think remains, even if all this other stuff has been surpassed by the internet and by digital um, cell phones and, and so forth. And I think it has a very, um, it, it still is unique. I mean, there's no other way other than through ham radio where you can do this kind of experimentation on a personal basis. You can transmit on, um, on, on, uh, on bands all the way from the low frequency spectrum well up into um, uh, in the millimeter range and everything in between. Um, the, the rules are still pretty loose. Basically, as long as you stay within certain power and emission limits, you can pretty much do anything you want. Uh, and, and there's really no other way you can do that except maybe getting an experimental license, which you know, is not something that individuals do very often. But ham radio still offers this, this unique opportunity to do hands-on experimentation and learning which uh, you know, taught me much of what I know. And I didn't taught me, teach me everything, of course. I mean, I still very much had to go to school and learn uh, especially the mathematics, to fill in all the gaps in my knowledge, but it, it motivated me, you know, it, ma it made it easier for me to, to learn all that stuff because I understood that it had a use and I could see how it fit into the stuff and explain the stuff that I was, that I was, already, uh, I was already learning. And as I said, there's a lot of new stuff now that we can, we can learn and, and play from, um, but we, we do have to adapt, we do have to change. So, I mean, I just listed, just thought last night about all the things that we have now that, that did not exist when I was back in that ham school high club, high, high school club, uh, um, and, you know, there's a long list of things that you can apply to education or use as part of ham radio. Uh, hams are already using the internet to link repeaters. Um, uh, of course, we obviously have digital radio, which uh, hams are finally now starting to adopt. We have GPS, we have AMSAT, we have the whole CubeSat revolution that was started by AMSAT, although AMSAT now has become kind of a minor player. But if you go to the CubeSat conferences, hundreds of people there from all sorts, I mean, mainly from the military, from commercial, from academic, and basically that whole thing was started by ham radio as an educational um, uh, avenue. It's been extremely successful. 
Uh, I mentioned the Raspberry Pi. Um, another thing that really impresses me is just how dense and big storage has gotten now. You know, I think that's one thing that Star Trek missed. I mean, they, they really anticipated a lot of things we have. One thing they didn't anticipate is that today I could have a storage device the size of the, of the nail on my little finger that could store all the original Star Trek episodes in high definition with plenty of room left over. I mean, they had those little wooden blocks that had one file on them, and no, no index, right? I mean, so, so even Star Trek missed some of the stuff that we have today. Um, and that's, that's pretty neat. We can, we can take advantage of that. Uh, we have the open source movement. That's very important because it is really designed to have people learn from it and, and enhance it as well as just to use it. And we had the maker movement. Um, it's really not really that new. It has a new name, but you know, that, the, the do-it-yourself tinkerer movement has been around for a long time. This is just the, the most uh, current incarnation. And uh, I think there's a lot to be gained from trying to, to, to join the maker movement with ham radio. There's not a lot of overlap right now, but I think there could be a lot more. I know Michelle is one of the, one of the people who could talk about this a lot. She's done a lot of work in this, this area. Um, which leads me to, okay, our current activity that, I'm, that, we're, that we're trying to do to get kids interested in ham radio and communications, which is high altitude ballooning. Now, I, I wrote satellites here and crossed it out because uh, uh, when I first got, when I first retired, I got a call from one of the mentors for local high school here, Mount Carmel uh, High, um, and was, the timing was perfect. I mean, I just retired and I was looking for a retirement project, and he told me they were interested in doing a CubeSat. Now, having been involved in AMSAT for a long time, I know something about spacecraft. I haven't done it professionally, but I've followed a number of projects. I know what's involved in the design and construction launch of a spacecraft. And it didn't seem to me that that's a particularly good fit to a high school. In fact, even universities have, have to really struggle uh, to finish CubeSat projects. So uh, I went over and made a pitch for, well, why don't we try how to do balloons instead? I mean, it's, it's a lot like space. Um, there's, there's a group of our, that, that's the group we're with now. Uh, they're a lot like space. You get close to space. You know, if you have a camera, the sky looks absolutely black. Uh, you really feel like you're in space. You have to design like that. You know, you have a payload. It's got to withstand these extreme environmental conditions. Uh, once you let it go, there's no fixing it. You know, it has to work. You have to test all this stuff ahead of time. But it's a much better impedance match for kids in, in, in a high school group. Um, it's it's, it's uh, something they can do typically in a semester or two, depending on how much you build and how much you buy. And that's always a, a decision, you know, we go back and forth on how much we want to, want to build and have them test. And um, I put test in parentheses because it's often skipped when it shouldn't be. Um, and it's not very expensive. I mean, a CubeSats can cost you know, $100,000 just to launch, and, and the hardware can, you know, depending on how, how much you buy, can cost, easily cost half a million if you're not careful. That's just simply out of, the, you know, out of scope for, for a high school. But a balloon, you can launch for no more than a few hundred dollars, and you have, often have a good chance of getting it back and flying it again. So, um, I, I can talk about the price of some of the things I'm, I'm going to show, but it's, you know, it's well within the range of a high school group, uh, which is some small donations. And of course, along the way, while we're doing this, we try to get them licensed. We, we have licensed study classes and go over the questions and, and try to interleave that along with sessions where we work on the balloon and, and, and get things done. Um, and like I said, this is close enough to space to interest kids. Now, one of my, one of my big uh, inspirations when I was a kid was the Apollo program. I mean, it was going on when I was in junior high and high school. It had a profound effect on me. Um, I remember vividly sitting in scout camp on the night of July 20th, 1969, watching you know, the first moonwalk on this tiny little black and white TV. And like every, all the other boys there, I'm, I'm just amazed that we have humans on the moon for the first time. But in addition, I'm amazed by the fact that we can talk to them and we can see them and, and hear them. You know, that, that, we were this tiny little dish that was so far away that light itself took three seconds to go out and come back. I mean, that just amazed me at, at the age of 12 that we could do that kind of thing with communications. And that kind of actually stirred my interest in communications. When I found out that hams, individuals, were bouncing signals off the moon, I said, I gotta get into this. And I didn't do it for a year or two because I didn't get into the ham club until then, but it was one of the things that inspired me. And also, I will have to sheep, uh, sheepishly admit that you know one of my secondary inspirations is you know Scotty from Star Trek. You know, I say I want to be able to do what that guy does. How, how many people would admit that Scotty was at least part of their inspiration for becoming an engineer, at least for the older guys? How many? How many are going to admit that? Okay, there's a few. There's a few who are honest about it. Okay, um, younger guys. Okay, I can understand. But um, okay, so. Um, this leads us to some of the uh, safety and regulatory issues. Um, fortunately, right now, the rules are not too strict. 
Uh, but given what's been going on with drones and the, the overreaction, in my opinion, to, to people who are irresponsible with drones, uh, th these may change. But right now, the, the rules for flying balloons, even around here in a populated area, are, are actually pretty reasonable. Uh, if you look at the rules, uh, they have an exemption. If you're below certain limits, you do not have to get permission. You can just fly whenever you want. Uh, and if you look at the, what these rules are, it's, it's obvious that they're written with an eye towards what would happen if an airplane actually ran into one. Now, I don't want that to happen, of course. I don't want to bet that there wouldn't be any damage. But you can, th these are the rules. You can, you can tell that's how they were written. If you, you, the lines have to break uh, easily. Uh, the payload can't be greater than a certain weight. That's fairly obvious. Um, and, but there's, of course, there's a catch-all that says you can't create any hazards. So if something did happen, we'd probably still be in trouble even if we technically followed the rules. But we obviously go out of our way to, we even talk to the FAA. We have, actually have the students, you know, make a contact with the FAA, tell them what we're doing even though it's not necessary, notify them when we're going to launch. They put out a NOTAM, uh, do, go through all that stuff even though we don't have to. Uh, so we, we do have that uh, base covered. Uh, so we fly two kinds of balloons. Uh, the first ones we fly, we, we still fly occasionally, are sounding balloons. These are ordinary weather balloons uh, made out of latex. Uh, they cost about $100 a piece for the larger model that we use. Uh, they can lift a couple kilograms to about 30 kilometers or 100,000 feet. Uh, they're made of latex, uh, which is very stretchy but weak. So when they, as they rise, they expand as the outside air pressure drops. And they just keep doing that until they get so big they eventually pop and then they come down. And you typically reach an altitude of 100, 110,000 feet, something like that, before they come down. And like I said, you can launch, you can carry a few kilograms, which is a lot today. You can carry you know, good cameras, you can carry uh, computers, you can carry transmitters, receivers, all sorts of stuff. Um, and you can do a lot in just a couple of kilograms. So there are actually a lot of individuals and students doing this. We're hardly the first, uh, which gives us a lot of other experience that we can, we can draw from. Uh, this is one of our, uh, uh, just a representative flight here. This was one that we, we launched a couple years ago. It was actually our fourth flight. Unfortunately, this is one we did not get back. It landed in the Salton Sea and nobody had a boat, so it's still out there somewhere. Uh, we know the equipment was ruined. I was hoping that if we could recover it, we could at least maybe extract the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the video off of it. Um, so you see the balloon. There's a, there's a parachute uh, with, a, um, with a hoop below it. The hoop is basically just to make sure the parachute inflates rapidly and our cameras show that that always happens. Um, below that, we have a radar corner reflector, uh, handmade, um, you know, everybody knows what a corner reflector is. That's so the FAA radars can see us. It's a legal requirement for the larger balloons, but we do it anyway, even though we're exempt. Uh, this was a little custom-made payload. This had three uh, GoPro-type cameras on, unfortunately, you know, because we lost it, we didn't get it back. Uh, but we had one looking up at the balloon, one looking out, and one looking down. Um, and the, the video really is the most satisfying part. Everybody loves to see video, and especially high quality video from altitude. Um, this is, this is always, always gets people's attention. Uh, you can get a little nauseous watching it with the camera spinning around with a, on a big screen, but uh, the, the video was always, always, always catches people's attention. And I have one at the end. And then the bottom, we had this little tracking payload. Uh, it uses um, a GPS receiver. Actually, had two GPSs. We had a spot unit. Uh, that ran by itself, and then a, a, uh, something called APRS, Amateur Position Reporting Service. That's a, a ham uh, protocol. If you know a, ADSB, this is basically you know the, the origins of it. It's just a GPS trans, uh, connected to a transmitter. It's, it's, it's beaconing out. And there's a worldwide network of ham stations that will pick these up and relay them over the internet. So you don't even have to do your own tracking. They'll, they'll pick you up, and you just get on the web, and you can find out where your where your payloads where your payloads gone. Um, so. That was the last we saw of that one. Um, the other type of balloon that we saw, that we, that we launched um, uh, more recently is called a super pressure balloon. Uh, that's probably an overstatement, but it's made of a stronger material than latex. It's made of mylar or nylon, something that will not stretch as easily. So you, you underfill it at launch. You barely put any gas in it at all. Uh, but as it goes up, you know, it stays limp until it fills you know, to its maximum volume. And at that point, it won't expand any further which means it won't rise any further and it won't pop. So it'll rise to an altitude and stay there pretty much indefinitely until, until something takes it down. Um, so um, we've launched two kinds of balloons that type. One was just a cheap Mylar party balloon, which cost a couple, a couple bucks from a party store. Um, they didn't last as long. We flew two of those. One made it to Quebec, I believe, and went down in the storm. The other one was last seen off the coast of South Carolina, and that was both were launched from here. But there's a company out there making these um, uh, balloons designed for um, exactly what we're doing. They're expensive. I mean, this one was uh, $190. Uh, 
Uh, but it was worth it because it actually performed uh, just as, a, as, a, as it was supposed to. Um, and the electronics side, uh, there's a, a lot of activity now among uh, a small group of very uh, avid um, hand balloonists to build the lightest possible payload they can. So there's several of these out there um, uh, that you, know, you can do a lot for less than 15 grams these days. Uh, the one that we're using was designed by Bill Brown in Huntsville, Alabama, WB at ELK, uh, his Pico tracker. Um, that, what you're looking at is weighs about 12 and a half grams. Uh, there's, a, there's a GPS U-blocks on there, there's a microcontroller, uh, uses a clock chip as a, as a transmitter, modulates the frequency to, to send FM. Uh, it's all powered by um, uh, so, little solar cells. You can see on the side, they're actually they're turned, they're turned sideways. Uh, there's no battery. We don't have a weight budget for a battery. Uh, so there is, there is a super cap on this one. I'm not sure it does a whole lot of good. That's the, 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 the silver rectangle in the middle of the board, in the back of the board. Uh, but it does shut down at night because we don't have any uh, power source at night, but it runs you know, definitely during the day as long as you've got sunlight. Um, so over at Mount Carmel, uh, we just got a call sign W6SUN. Their mascot is the Sun Devils, hence the call sign. Uh, we've had, to date had four sounding balloon flights. The uh, first two were in helium, then we switched to hydrogen because helium's getting really expensive these days. Uh, each one of them has carried various custom payloads, cameras, APRS for tracking, uh, also typically spot as a backup. Uh, we got three out of the four left. Uh, we, we typically target for a spot that's an um, off road RV area southwest of the Salton Sea. We almost always overrun it. We hit it only once. That was the first time we got lucky. Uh, one, uh, two actually landed in the Salton Sea. Uh, the second one we did manage to get. Uh, the third one almost landed in Arizona, but our poor teacher was willing to drive all the way out there in the desert and find it. Of course, he knew exactly where it was, which, which helped. Uh, so in addition to those, we did two of these Mylar flights with uh, the Pico trackers. And I, I mentioned that one made it, uh, well, actually, we last saw it in Minneapolis, and I'm pretty sure it went down in Quebec that night. And then one was last seen off the coast of South Carolina. And uh, we also more recently launched one of those uh, SBS 13s with a, a, uh, a different version of the Pico tracker that transmits a modulation method called Whisper, weak signal propagation reporter on 20 meters. Unfortunately, the antenna for that one was very long and very fragile. We believe we probably uh, broke it at launch. We could hear it, but it got very weak very quickly, and we haven't heard from it since. So we have to classify that one as a failure. But you know we'll learn and we'll we'll fix it and we'll we'll do it again. Uh, so here's a, a video of one of the uh, launches of the uh, of the uh, uh, party balloon type yeah. balloons. So do it in the morning when all the kids are around waiting to go to class so they can right they can watch. So, Notice the balloon is underfilled. It's got hydrogen, perfect. but it's not filled. And there it goes. Out over the ocean. Yeah, so yeah, he com one of our other advisors comments out over the ocean. We didn't really intend to do that. Uh, we didn't check the winds as carefully as you should that day. And so after I left, I'm sitting in a Burger King looking at my laptop, looking at Flight Aware and my own ADSB receiver, and I'm watching thing go west and right through Lindbergh's departure space. Um, ooh. Um, well, you know, we're exempt, you know. Uh, you know. Um, but, you know, I'm also noticing we're already at 10,000 feet and they're at 5,000 feet, so, okay, you know. But I'm also watching and it's suddenly, you know, plane coming in the normal approach path and he suddenly makes this big turnaround, all the planes start turning, oh my God, what's going on here? And then I realize, oh, it's a Santa Ana condition, they flipped a the runway, it's not us. Oh, okay, all right. I don't want to go through that. Um, the next time we check the wind, we make absolutely sure. Yeah. Um, over at UCSD, this is a more recent effort, we've organized a CubeSat club over there. Uh, we've really only done it for like one year now, but we did get one of these uh, long duration flights going back in February. This one was actually quite successful. This one carried the two meter version of the tracker and it had, had made six full circumnavigations to the earth. We could track this on APRS. We couldn't track it continuously. We'd only see it when it was over a ground station and in sunlight. Uh, so we always observed five of these. We're pretty sure it made an additional loop up in the Arctic and then came back down again because that's what the wind predictions were saying. And it was last seen in the beginning of June near Beijing, China. Uh, that's the last we heard from it. The winds showed it going down into the tropics, so it probably went down in a storm somewhere in the tropics. We have a lively debate going on and just what it is that brings them down. Uh, one, one, uh, Bill's theory is uh, icing, which is certainly possible. Uh, my theory is, is that they get caught in an updraft and are pushed up until the balloon bursts. 
I mean, all these are possible. Um, so we, because we don't have the data to, to actually know. So here's, uh, this was the, uh, the launch over at UCSD back in February. The thing looks like an oversized Garmin bag, but you know, costs $190, but it's actually worth it. Uh, and there's the group, and then um, we let it go. Um, and again, you know, very, very little gas in it because it'll expand when you get to altitude. This one went to about 42, 43,000 feet or so. It stayed very stable the whole time. It, was, it didn't lose any gas at all during the time that we tracked it. So once again, this one went west, but I won't talk about that. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, I mentioned Whisper, the weak signal propagation reporter. Uh, this is one of a new family of modes, digital modes being used in, in ham radio that were uh, developed by Joe Taylor, K1JT. Um, Joe has been on this for, I don't know, 20 years now, I guess, making a whole family of these uh, incredibly robust but very slow digital modulation methods designed for extremely marginal uh, amateur channels, starting with moon bounce. Um, he actually credits um, Dr. Tom Clark and myself for a paper that we wrote about 1996 in which we laid out modulation and coding, all, all the theory that might be required to, to be able to bounce an amateur signal off the moon using much smaller antennas, much less power than is normally done. Normally it's done with these gigantic arrays and full legal power, which is a, at the time I guess it was 1,000 watts, now it's, now it's more. Uh, but he, we wanted to do it a little more elegantly. One day I walked into my boss's office at Qualcomm, Franklin Antonio, and the end of his shelf he had a book entitled Radio Properties of the Moon. And I had to immediately grab it. I just read the whole thing all the way through. and said, this is exactly what I needed to design you know, a modulation method uh, that will work off the moon. So we published a paper about this, but I didn't actually take it any further. But Joe picked it up and, and actually did it, and, and it worked. And it's become an extremely popular mode now in amateur radio. It's got a whole family of these modes. Uh, Whisper is one of the newer ones. Uh, it's designed not to go off the moon, but as, as an HF propagation sounder. So it's extremely slow. It's 50 bits sent over two minutes uh, using rate one half FEC. Uh, I think he's got my Fano decoder in there. Um, using Fourier module, Fourier FSK modulation. Uh, the, the shifts, of course, are so small you can't even hear them unless you listen very, very carefully. And it's extremely robust, as you would expect for something that slow and, and, and strongly coded. So a 20 watt transmitter is, is actually enough to be heard in lots of places. Here, here's an example. This is a shot from one of Bill's talks showing his balloon transmitting at 20 meters outside in the middle of the Atlantic being heard by all those stations on either side and even one in Australia. Uh, this is on 20 meters, 14 megahertz amateur band. So it's, a, it's, it's very, um, very robust and, and very successful. That's what we were trying to fly at Mount Carmel when we broke the antenna. But we're gonna try again, always try again. So uh, one open problem with um, uh, these balloons, I mentioned they, they fly only in the daytime uh, because we have solar power, but, and they shut down at night. So I'm, I've been racking my brain trying to think of other energy sources we might use and also challenge the students on this. And I can't really think of any with the possible exception of AM broadcast stations. If you float near one with long enough antenna, you might be able to pick up like a crystal set, pick up enough energy. Um, but right now, only solar is practical. I, I can't think of anything else. You're up in the stratosphere. The stratosphere is very smooth. There's no turbulence, so you can't really do any mechanical uh, energy harvesting. So AM broadcast station is the only idea I have. If anybody else has any great ideas, please let me know. And I discovered by looking at this that there's a whole sub-industry now in energy harvesting. There's whole families of chips designed to you know, get, extract small amounts of energy from very small solar cells or from piezoelectric uh, devices that, uh, you know, that, that extract mechanical motion. A lot of it's for biotechnology, so you can plant sensors that don't have to have batteries. But there's a whole field here, and I never knew this really existed until I had a problem like it myself uh, to solve. So um, there are a lot of opportunities here in some, even something as simple as a balloon flight to get students interested in solving new problems, maybe, maybe even contribute to the state of the art. Um, so having done this now as, as a volunteer, uh, and remember I'm trained as an engineer and not as a teacher, I do have some thoughts from my experiences on education, especially at the high school and, and, and um, undergraduate level. Uh, first of all, I'm still learning as I go. Um, I don't, I mean, when I went in, I knew that, you know, I, I, the teacher's job is not that easy, but I've really learned that having watched the, the teacher, uh, Mr. John Ernest, who was the sponsor of the club at Mount Carmel, and having talked to him, I mean, a teacher's job is not easy. You may think it is, but he told me, in fact, a cautionary tale when I went in. He's talk, he talks about, well, yeah, we know we get these guys who retire from industry, and they think they're going to have a nice, cushy job teaching at a high school, you know, 
and they don't usually last long. Now, I don't think he was talking to me. I think he was just sort of talking in general like a cautionary tale, but having watched him and, and what, how he has to work, I, I know what he's talking about. Teaching is not easy, and they certainly don't get paid much, so like he says, he does this as his passion. If it wasn't his passion, he wouldn't be there. Um, the kids that we see, remember, this is a self-selected group. We're meeting out of hours, and uh, we're not um, uh, uh, you know, giving them credit for this. So they're all self-selected, and they're there, they're bright, they're motivated. I'm very aware of that. I want to make sure they keep coming back. Not all of them do, but I want to you know, keep it interesting enough they keep coming back. But you know, don't expect that they know much. They may be bright, but you know, a lot of the things I knew that I kind of just assumed that most kids would know, they don't. But that's OK. I mean, they're there to learn. Um, and you um, have to just explain everything. Uh, many of them, they're bright, they're good in math and science, but they only know the difference between a scientist and an engineer. I have to explain that. They don't have any role models in their families, no scientists or engineers, which kind of surprised me. I thought we were all over San Diego, but that's, that's just not true. Um, but the number one frustration all through this has been time. Um, they always have things that, that preempt meetings. You know, there's there's uh, band practice, there's stu there's uh, exam week, there's study week, all these kinds of things. Maintaining momentum through this is, is always difficult, and it's the number one frustration that we have. Um, other you know other random thoughts in education. Uh, you know, like I said, they come in not knowing much, but you really have to ma make sure they understand they're welcome to answer questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question as long as they want to know the answer because they are trying to learn. That's how you learn. Um, I always keep trying to look for new ways to explain all ideas, no matter how old it is. I always feel like I can come up with a better analogy. And for example, when I'm explaining forward error correction codes for the first time, I use this analogy as a Sudoku puzzle. I mean, almost everybody knows what a Sudoku puzzle is. And what is it? It's actually an, error, it's an erasure correcting code, right? It's exactly what it is. I, I wrote an algorithm for it that was uh, to solve it, which is basically sequential decoding. And everybody knows what Sudoku puzzle is. By analogy, all of a sudden, oh, OK, now I understand what these do. You got these little rules, and you use them to figure out what's missing or what's, what's an error. Um, projects, like balloon projects, are good servers but bad masters. Now, this is something I have a little bit of friction with the other, uh, uh, other mentors. Um, they, some of these guys have go fever. You know, they want to get the balloon launched. They want to get done. They want to get it launched. And I'm saying, well, wait a minute. The whole point here is for them to learn something along the way. Now, actually, I think this tension is helpful because if it were just me, we'd probably never fly anything. Okay, I mean, I'd admit that. Okay, so it's good to actually have a range of, of of experiences and views on this because the idea is to learn something and also fly it so the kids get gratification out of what they did. But it's also important to give them little bits of gratification along the way, little sub projects that they can see working. Uh, that was important for me. You know, the kid, you have a short attention span. And it's good to always have you know, little things along the way, little rewards along the way, rather than having to do us a lot of work for a big payoff that you know, will come sometime later. Um, I feel very strongly that getting students to build stuff without understanding what they're doing is simply immoral. I mean, we joke about grad students and slave labor, but you know, I think there's a serious message here. Uh, one evening, I saw um, one of the, uh, the women who was one of the students who was building one of those radar reflectors. Somebody had given her a job, and she's sitting off, you know, and pasting it up and stapling. And I said, "Do you know what you're doing, and why? You know what this is, and why you're doing it?" She had no idea. So I explained, you know, what a radar recorder reflector is, how it works, why we need it, safety issue. She said, "Oh, okay, thank you." You know, and then I could see that she was a lot more enthusiastic at that point. But you know, the point again is to make them learn. It's not to get the project done. The project is just a vehicle. But the end result of this is that they come out and enjoy the process. They understand something about engineering. And they, and they learn something. One thing I'm still trying to figure out is a proper balance between competition and cooperation. I've also seen robotics clubs be very successful. I've, I've helped judge some of them. And uh, competition does seem to motivate students. I mean, after all, I mean, sports are a big thing. It wasn't for me when I was in school. But uh, I'm still trying to think of you know, what, what level of competition do you want to introduce a contest here with teams? I mean, what is the proper level when you're trying to teach something with a large ham radio communications element? I'm, I'm not, still not sure about that one. But all along, you have to go in there and make it really obvious that you enjoy this stuff. I mean, you're here, you're retired, you still want to do this stuff, and you want to pass on the next generation. And I, I think that's infectious. I, I think I do a good job of that, and so do the other mentors. Uh, cost is a major issue. Um, you know, students have a tight budget. Um, right now, I'm, I'm building a small um, general purpose software defined radio that, use, that runs on the Raspberry Pi and uses a, a FunCube dongle, or probably could use an RTL SDR. And that, that's the kind of price point. I mean, Things like, uh, like uh, USRPs are wonderful for here, but you know, you're not going to get most high school students that fork down you know, 
$100 for, for one of those boxes. So it's got to be something cheap, even if it doesn't perform well. Because, uh, you know, when I was in high school, I had a similarly limited budget. So that, that is very important. It's the one thing I would like to see is more low-end SDRs, even if they're not all that capable. So I, I think ham radio is still very educational as long as we keep it up to date. Uh, lots of things we can do now, especially ballooning is a good vehicle. There are probably other projects, and ballooning is a fun one. Uh, for many students, it's their first taste of engineering. You know, they get to make trade-offs. They say engineering is all, it's the, it's the art of making trade-offs. You've got five different possibilities. You've got to pick the right one. If you don't know which is the right one, well, maybe you need some experiments and find out. One day, I saw them voting on various aspects of the design, and the votes were all like 50-50 and all very hesitant. And I said, well, you know, you can vote if you want to, but in my experience, when a group is divided like this on a technical issue, it usually means you don't know enough to make a decision. Well, maybe you should not take a vote. You should go off and explore each of them. And then when you come back, maybe it'll be obvious to everybody what the right answer is. You won't have to take a vote. You know, engineering is not a democracy. They said, oh, OK, you know, I, th I think they learned that. So, uh, and it's also, of course, very rewarding for the mentors. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be over there. It's really fun to see. You know, I, I like to say that when I was like four or five years old, I enjoyed hooking up lights and switches and batteries and making light bulbs come on. Well, now I kind of like making different kind of light bulb come on. And it's just as gratifying, if not more so. So anyway, questions, um, comments? Yeah. You said that the balloons that you used uh, would stay up almost indefinitely until something happened. How long does that usually take to happen, and what does um, happen? Well, I, the, one, the, one, the one flight we have, we launched in, in February, and it came down or disappeared in June. So, and we believe it was probably because it moved in the tropics, and there are taller thunderstorms in the tropics. So it seems to be basically about staying above weather. If the weather comes up to get you, you'll probably go down. That seems to be it. This, by the way, is a little clip that one of the guys put together just uh, summarizing one of our flights. I thought I'd just let this run. Well. We're doing questions. Yeah, in the back. Hi. Okay. I'm not an expert in this at all, but you were looking for some way to harvest energy at nighttime. Uh, 2005, Ted Sargent out of the University of Toronto proved that he could uh, uh, convert infrared. So it's uh, colloidal quantum dots. So if you might want to look into that. There's okay. Well, what's the, what's the primary energy source? What's it's the environment? Infrared. Sorry? Non-visible light, infrared. Non-visible light, infrared. Oh, and so they are, at nighttime. They're, they're okay. about 10% efficient, and they're trying to do spray-on stuff, but I'm not an expert. Okay. I was a guy that looked at it and said, oh, I'll be able to charge things, and it's been many years since then, and it's not commercial commercial yet, so okay. I don't know where it's at. Thanks. Sir, thank you very much for uh, doing that with the kids. I, I happen to live around that area. I know Mount Carmel High School. Um, there, there was one project that I was uh, privileged enough to have had a, um, a, a briefing on uh, from Google, uh, the Loon project. The and Loon I project. Believe, I yeah. believe they don't, uh, they don't, they've stopped using or uh, doing uh, experiments on the Loon project. You may may be able to uh, have some collaboration, some using materials. Uh, yeah, the th those are huge have. balloons that they're flying. They're designed yes. to do, I think, internet. Access service. I, I'm Correct. interested in them, but I haven't been able to find much information. I I'll, see them I'll, occasionally on ADSB, but I'll uh, I'll, I'll t get in touch with you and then thank I'll, you. I'll see thank if you. I can dig up thank some you. info. Anyone else? Thank you. Sir, who's taking over? Okay. Is there a break now? Uh... Tom, are you in the room? <laughs> 